Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, right after the end of the spring semester and in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since we do not yet know for sure what format our classes will take in the fall, and since there's some likelihood that at least some of us, both students and faculty, will have to be away from campus for a time should the mitigation plans prove ineffective or should compliance with or enforcement of public health guidelines prove impossible, I am preparing a video version of each of my lectures for the class to have it ready if and when it is needed. It's also the case that necessary distancing requirements in the classrooms may make it impossible that the entire class can be in the same room at the same time. In that case, those whose turn it is to stay away from campus may find these video lectures a better option than relying on a live classroom feed via Zoom or some other technology. So if you're watching this video, it means that we are, for reasons of public and personal health, still unable to meet together in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom format. All the same, I'll continue to do my best to teach you what I know with whatever tools I have at my disposal. Enjoy the lecture. So let's take a look at our first speech of the semester, which is the famous James Otis speech in the trial on writs of assistance from 1761 in the period before the American Revolution. So our speaker is James Otis, born in 1725 and died in 1783. He was born in Barnstable, Massachusetts on Cape Cod, and Otis was a member of the Harvard College class of 1743. And indeed, when Otis attended Harvard, he would have participated in a curriculum that included a significant study of classical rhetoric including orations by Cicero and other famous classical orators. He would have studied the theoretical work of classical writers on rhetoric like Aristotle, Cicero, and Quintilian. After graduating from Harvard, he became a lawyer. Indeed, uh, by the time of the Writs of Assistance case, he was one of the most noteworthy lawyers in, in Boston. He was also a member of the Massachusetts Colonial Legislature, the House of Representatives, at the time. And he was the brother of Mercy Otis Warren, who was the wife of James Warren and the author of a number of interesting revolutionary uh, plays or dialogues that were very critical of the British ministry. In 1764, now this is after the 1761 Writs of Assistance trial, Otis summarized the position of the colonies in the dispute with Great Britain in a pamphlet he wrote entitled The Rights of the British Colonies Asserted and Proved. And it's important to note here, as it is with regard to the Writs of Assistance case, that in 1764 or 1761, uh, Americans did not consider themselves as independent. They were not arguing, as the title of Otis's pamphlet indicates, they were not arguing for a separate bill of American rights, but they wanted to enjoy the same British rights as any uh, citizen of Great Britain. So they thought of themselves still as subjects of the king and as citizens of Great Britain. Otis was elected to represent Massachusetts in the Stamp Act Congress, which was held in Albany in 1765 as a way of coordinating the opposition to the Stamp Act among all of the 13 colonies. And he continued then uh, for a number of years as a member of the Massachusetts legislature. And finally, Otis died by a lightning strike in 17. 83. So that's a brief uh, summary biography of James Otis Jr. Uh, now let's take a look at the famous Writs of Assistance trial. So we want to remember that at the time of this trial, Massachusetts is a British colony. Uh, 
and it's happening the year after the end of the French and Indian War. We call the French and Indian War the war that is referred to in Europe as the Seven Years' War, but it's a war between Great Britain and France for colonial control, not just in North America, but indeed throughout the world. But it was a, a war that was fought in North America, um, mainly over who would control Canada. And there were the British forces and their allies, the colonial American forces and some Indian tribes, and then the French forces on the other side with their Indian allies as well. But in accomplishing this victory over France in, in the 1750s and ending in 1760, that war created a fairly substantial war debt for Great Britain. So they needed to find a way to pay off that national debt. And one of the things they sought to do was to be more vigorous in their enforcement of tax laws in the colonies. So Britain had to collect taxes and import duties as a way of paying off that debt. And so one of the things that they did was that they used what was called a writ of assistance. And so when there were, for instance, colonial customs officers, so a customs officer would be a British official he would be stationed in a seaport like Boston or Salem, for instance, or perhaps even Portsmouth. And it would be his responsibility to make sure that all goods that were imported um, had duties collected on them. This was a way in which the British government collected its revenue. But to make sure that there wasn't any smuggling, they also had to search for contraband, that is, search different places for smuggled goods, goods that uh, on which the duties had not been paid. And to assist them in that search effort, they had these um, official legal documents called writs. And the writ of assistance was a document that enabled a customs official to go to a local justice of the peace or a sheriff or a constable and request assistance in searching a warehouse or a shop or a cellar to see if there was any smuggled contraband hidden there. So the writ of assistance functioned in some ways like a search warrant, but it's called a writ of assistance because it enabled the customs official to enlist the assistance of a local um, um, justice of the peace or sheriff or other officer of the law. So the writ of assistance, however, is widely opposed by merchants and shopkeepers because they didn't want to have their shops and their cellars and their warehouses searched by the government. And no doubt they were also resistant about paying duties and taxes to the British government. And so the merchants of Boston hired James Otis to argue their case against the issuance of new writs of assistance. Now, in 1760, at the end of the year 1760, in November, a man by the name of James Cockle applies for a writ of assistance when the Massachusetts court is seated at Salem. The court decides to postpone the hearing on the writ until the following February, and in the meantime, they instruct Otis and others to do some research into the legality of those writs. Otis at the time was the advocate general for Massachusetts, which is in effect like a district attorney or an attorney general. He's arguing cases on the side of the crown, on the side of Great Britain in the colonial courts. But Upon that instruction to go search out the legality of the writs, Otis decides that he cannot defend that position. He resigns his post and takes up the opposition to the writ on behalf of the Boston merchants. And you'll see him refer to this in the introduction to the speech. So the key legal principle involved in the case is the right of 
of the government to search a private dwelling, right? And on what conditions or for what reasons can a search warrant be issued to do that? Part of the problem with the writ of assistance is, as Otis explains, it functions like a general warrant. That is, once a customs official has that writ in hand, he may search any building without having to go to the court first and swear out an, on oath that he suspected certain goods were hidden in that building. Rather, he had the writ in hand, he could go to any sheriff or constable and immediately search the building without having to have a judge or a magistrate certify that the writ was legal. So it was functioning as a general search warrant rather than a special writ. And you'll see Otis in this speech draw the distinction between special writs, which he acknowledges are legal, that is those writs um, about which there has been um, a hearing in front of a magistrate, and those writs used like the writ of assistance, which are general in nature and allow for a general search. So the case is held in 1761 in February. Again, Otis is now arguing on the side of the Boston merchants and in opposition to the writ of assistance applied to by James Cockle. But in the meantime, George II has died and George III is now the new king of Great Britain. And because there's a new king, every existing writ would expire six months after the death of the king. So whatever the court decided in this particular case would become the law for all such writs. And so the significance of the trial uh, is um, much larger after the death of George II. Now, John Adams, who was a young attorney in Boston at the time, was present in the courtroom when James Otis gave his speech. And this is what Adams said about Otis's speech. Otis was a flame of fire with a promptitude of classical allusions, a depth of research, a rapid summary of historical events and dates, a profusion of legal authorities, a prophetic glance of his eye into futurity, and a torrent of impetuous eloquence. He hurried away everything before him. American independence was then and there born. So a pretty significant testimony by Adam saying, in effect, the American Revolution begins with this speech by James Otis in 1761 in opposition to British colonial writs of assistance. So we begin with this question as we think analytically about this speech. We begin with the question, what is the genre of the speech? That is, to what classical genre of rhetoric does the Otis speech belong, and how do we know that? Well, think about first where this speech is heard. That is, what kind of venue or what kind of circumstance exists uh, as the context for the speech. We know the speech is given in the Superior Court of Massachusetts in 1761. The fact that it's taking place in a courtroom is a very good clue about the type of speech that it is. And then we can think about the kinds of issues or the sort of judgment that the judges are being asked to render here. And those are questions or issues related to justice, right? And so that tells us this is a forensic speech. That is, it's a speech of the law courts focused on questions of justice and injustice, not precisely questions of accusation and defense as you might find in a criminal trial, but nonetheless, kind of a speech or kind of an argument that draws on topics related to what is and what is not just lawful or legal. So a forensic speech. And then we can turn to the question about rhetorical situation. And if you took a look at the Bitzer article, one of those key elements is the question of exigence. Exigence, you will recall, as Bitzer says, is the need or the problem. It's the thing that's other than it should be that inspires or motivates the introduction of rhetorical discourse into the situation. So in this case, we could look at 
what was it that inspired Otis to make this address? And we could answer that it was the perceived injustice or the perceived threat to the rights and liberties of the British subjects living in Boston. He saw what he considered to be a violation of the Constitution and tries to correct that by making an argument. So that's the problem, or what we would call in rhetorical criticism, the exigence of the rhetorical situation. Then there's the question of the audience. And in one sense, the audience is quite small. The argument takes place, the trial takes place in what is now called the Old State House, depicted here on the left of the slide. And indeed, if you go down to Boston and take the Freedom Trail tour, you can go into the Old State House and actually go into the room where this trial took place and where Otis made that speech that John Adams said began the American Revolution. But you'll see that it's not a very big room. There was maybe 60 people altogether present when the speech was given. And certainly people heard uh, discussions about it after the fact. But the text of the speech isn't made public for another 12 years until 1773 when it appears in a local newspaper, the Massachusetts Spy. It's then subsequently republished a number of times, and as we'll talk about in a little while, John Adams also helps to make the speech famous. But the question of the immediate audience is simply the legal community of Boston, the judges and the other lawyers who were present. But we also know, as Bitzer explains, that the rhetorical audience in a rhetorical situation includes only those who not only can be persuaded, but who have some power or authority to um, mitigate or amend the exigence, that is to modify the exigence in response to the appeal made by the orator. And so in that case, it's only the judges, the judges who will make the legal decision about whether or not writs of assistance should be issued, those people are the rhetorical audience in this circumstance. They are the ones who Otis has to persuade and who will make a decision either favorable or unfavorable to his position. And as it turns out, they decide against James Otis. However, even though Otis loses the case in 1761, we know that because of the argument he made, it had an extended influence much later and even really up into our own days in American history. Then we can talk about the constraints in the rhetorical situation. And by constraints, we mean what are the circumstances with regard to the existing legal precedents, the existing values, the existing laws, the beliefs of the members of his audience, and in particular the judges, like what are the traditions with regard to uh, using a court decision to overturn acts of parliament. Those kinds of legal precedents can be a constraint on the orator. The orator must take all of that in mind when making a case for or against uh, a particular legal um, act. And then we can also consider other matters such as the existing animosity between Great Britain and the colonies, the growing uh, reluctance of, of people in the colonies to uh, have Great Britain uh, demand taxes from them when they are not represented in Parliament. And so all of these, both the immediate legal questions and the wider political context, create constraints on Otis. They tell him, in effect, these kinds of arguments are likely to work and these others might be less successful. So he recognizes certainly the constraints on him and we can begin to identify them as well. So here are some of the critical questions we can ask in relation to this uh, famous legal speech. How might Otis have understood that writs of assistance were the worst instruments of arbitrary power, as he said? 
and how did this power threaten American liberty? And to what U.S. constitutional protection is the writ of assistance related? And how is Otis's speech relevant to your own constitutional rights today? Well, certainly in relation to the first question, we can see that if the government can enter into your house anytime they want and search for anything they want without having first getting permission to do that from a judge, you could see how that would be uh, an exercise of arbitrary power. And such ar the exercise of such arbitrary power would indeed be a threat to liberty, not only to the liberty of Americans living in the British colonies, but we would consider them to be threats to American liberty even today. And that's partly why, certainly, we have within the U.S. Constitution that Fourth Amendment in the Bill of Rights, which protects citizens from unreasonable search and seizure. It uh, makes sure that citizens can be secure in their dwellings and in their houses and in their papers and effects. The government can't just search your records or your house or your car without a warrant. And then how is Otis's speech relevant to your own constitutional rights today? And of course, if we think about the growth of the surveillance state and the growth of the intrusion of government into the private lives of people, we are dealing with issues even today that had their origin in the debates on in the writs of assistance trial. And then we can ask further, in what specific ways do you think James Otis's speech expresses a radical political doctrine? Again, J uh, John Adams thought this was the beginning of the American Revolution, and hardly anybody alive then would have expressed the opinion that America would be independent in just 15 years, but no doubt they would think of that as a radical political development. And yet do we see the origins or the seeds of a radical politics in James Otis's speech? In one sense, we could in, in the fact that he is challenging acts of parliament. And as will be clear as we go along, he's obviously doing it because he sees the writ of assistance not just as a legal instrument, but as an instrument for revenue collection. And it's pretty clear that in the course of this trial, although it's not included in the text of the speech that we have now, but in the course of the trial, he makes the argument that taxation without representation is tyranny. And so we see the very origins of one of those principal arguments against British policy that led to the American Revolution. We also note that Otis argued that acts against the Constitution should be null and void. What did he mean and how or by whom would such an act as a writ of assistance be declared null and void? For us now, and we could add in this final question because it relates um, to this middle question. How does that relate to ju judicial practice today? We think about now how if Congress passes a law and someone believes that law is unconstitutional, what do they do? They would sue in federal court to overturn that law. And it would be up to the court to determine that a law passed by the legislative body, that is by the U.S. Congress, whether or not that law uh, was consistent with the principles of the Constitution or violated the Constitution. And so now we take it as a matter of course, that is we take it for granted that our courts and especially the United States Supreme Court will be the final arbiter of whether a legislative act is constitutional or not. But it was not always that way. And certainly in the time of colonial America, it was not that way at all. Indeed, in 1761, the presumption was that parliament itself would determine whether its own legislative acts were legal or not, whether their acts violated the Constitution or not. It was not the practice that a court could determine 
that a legislative act, such as the one which establishes writs of assistance, whether such an act was constitutional or not. But this is what Otis is demanding. He's demanding of the court that the court declare the writs of assistance to be unconstitutional, and because they violate the Constitution, the act that that um, establishes writs of assistance would be declared null and void. And so another thing that we see in the long-term influence of the Otis speech is the introduction of this theory of judicial supremacy, the idea that it's the courts who will determine whether or not a legislative act is constitutional or not. It didn't work in 1761, but the idea that the courts would be supreme in that um, was in fact adopted later in American law and especially in constitutional practice. So that today it is the United States Supreme Court, for instance, who is the final arbiter of the constitutionality of acts of legislation. So let's take a look at some of the key passages in the speech as we consider James Otis's argument against writs of assistance. And I want to begin here at the opening uh, passages to point out a couple of things. We mentioned that Otis resigned his post as advocate general and then took up the cause of the Boston merchants in opposing writs of assistance. And this is what he's making reference to here in the uh, passage that I've marked with the gray highlight here. He says, I have accordingly considered it and now appear in obedience to, or, to your order, but likewise in behalf of the inhabitants of this town who have presented another uh, petition and out of regard to the liberties of the subject. He's indirectly referring to the fact that he was instructed by the court at the first hearing in Salem to look into the legality of the writs. And he's done that, he says, I appear not only in obedience to your order, but now he's also referencing the fact that he's on the other side of the question. That is, he's taken up the case for the inhabitants of the town, for the merchants who are opposing the writs, right? And because he believes their liberties, that is the liberties of the subject, that is the subjects of Great Britain or the subjects of the king, that their liberties are in danger. So it's out of regard for their liberties that he has taken up the case. And he does so, he says, in this next passage I've highlighted here in blue, because he believes all such instruments of slavery on the one hand and villainy on the other as this writ of assistance is. So it is, he clearly sees this as an instrument of slavery, that is political slavery, in the sense that if you allow the government to be able to search people without first having to swear before a magistrate um, and gain and make the ar probable cause argument that that gives too much power to the government and power is always seen as a threat to liberty. And here's where Otis makes this argument here that it is, he believes, the writ of assistance is the worst instrument of arbitrary power, the most destructive of English liberty and the fundamental principles of law that ever was found in an English law book. So we note again, it's English or British liberty that Otis is defending. We aren't yet at the position where we can talk about a separate independent America or separate independent set of American rights and liberties. He's defending what he considers to be traditional British liberties. Then we move on, and again he makes reference to his status in the case and his position. He says, I was solicited to argue this case as Advocate General, and because I would not, I have been charged with desertion from my office. To this charge, I can give a very sufficient answer. I renounced that office, and I argue this cause from the same principle. And again, that principle is it's in favor, he says, of British liberty. Okay? Then we move down a little further because he says this is one of those principles, right? The only principles of public conduct that are worthy of a gentleman or a man. 
are to sacrifice estate, ease, health, and applause, and even life to the sacred calls of his country. And his country in this case, we could say certainly his country is Great Britain, more particularly his country is Massachusetts, okay? He thinks of Massachusetts as his native country, certainly understands its colonial status in reference to Great Britain, but he thinks people of Massachusetts and the people of all the other colonies should fully enjoy the same rights as any British citizen. So it's the sacred calls of his country, the threat to their liberties, that is the principle for his public conduct in this moment. So then he begins to make the argument against the writs of assistance. He says, first, drawing out the distinction, I will admit that writs of one kind may be legal, that is, special writs directed to special officers to search certain houses, etc. Right? So if you're a customs official and you go to a magistrate or a judge and you say, I have it on good information or I have sworn testimony from an informant that John Hancock smuggled uh, 30 casks of wine and has them hidden in his basement and the basement is located in his house on Beacon Street and I want a warrant to go search, right? If the judge thinks the evidence is sufficient to establish probable cause, he would issue the warrant and the warrant would allow the customs official and perhaps with the sheriff or a constable to go and search Mr. Hancock's basement. But after that, the writ would expire. But in the case of writs of assistance, once that writ is issued to the customs officer, not in response to a particular case or not because probable cause was established, but just because it was an instrument of the customs official, the customs official doesn't need to go before a judge and swear probable cause, but rather has that and is able then to search and to enlist the assistance of other officers of the law to search any building at any time for any potential smuggled goods or any other contraband of any other kind any time he wanted to. So this is the distinction that Otis is making between special writs and writs of assistance such as he's opposing, which act as general warrants. He says the writ prayed for in this petition, and we go back to James Cockle petitioning the court for the issuance of a writ, right? The writ, paid, the writ prayed for in this petition is illegal, Otis says. It is a power that places the liberty of every man in the hands of every petty officer. I say, I admit that spe special writs of assistance to search special places may be granted to certain persons on oath, but I deny the writ now prayed for can be granted because, as he makes the argument, it is a general writ. So as we go on, we see him object to particular aspects of the writ of assistance. In the first place, the writ is universal, being directed to all in singular justices, sheriffs, constables, and all other officers and subjects. So anybody that the customs official goes to who has some legal status as an officer of the court must assist the customs official in that search. And it has to be done even though the customs official hasn't gone before a magistrate or a judge to prove probable cause. And then Otis points out, a man is accountable to no person for his doings. Why? Because he doesn't have to appear in court to show that he has good reason to believe smuggling has been committed. And then after the search, he doesn't have to return to court and report on what was found and whether any illegal activity was determined to have been committed. Okay? And then one of the famous lines in the speech where Otis says, a man's house is his castle, and whilst he is quiet, he is as well guarded as a prince in his castle. And this is one of the fundamental principles of American liberty even today. That is the right to be secured in your papers and effects, to not have your house invaded by the government, to not have your privacy disrupted by a search, right, without probable cause. 
But as Otis points out, this writ, if it should be declared legal, would totally annihilate this privilege. Bare suspicion without oath is sufficient. As we move on, he says, again, these writs are not returned. Writs in their nature are temporary things. That is, special writs are temporary. They only exist until the search is completed. But, he, but these, he says, live forever. That is, they're perpetual. They're, the customs official has them as long as he's in office. But Otis points out, the fact that the writs are issued doesn't mean they're legal. All precedents, he says, are under the control of the principles of law. No acts of parliament can establish such a writ because, as he argues, an act against the Constitution is void. And this is another one of the great principles that he introduces in the speech, the idea that the court should determine that the parliamentary law which establishes such a writ is declared unconstitutional or it's void because it is against the Constitution. And this again is the point that he emphasizes as he closes the speech, that such magistrate, if he think proper, should issue a special warrant to a constable to search the places. And that's all, says Otis, that the existing statutes, the existing laws of parliament can prove. He refers to the sixth of Anne, which is a law passed in the sixth year of the reign of Queen Anne, but it makes the point, that particular law makes the point that writs must be renewed upon the death of a sovereign, but it's only special writs, says Otis, that the original legislation is referring to. But by making them general warrants, Parliament has exceeded its power and has violated the Constitution. So this is Otis's argument. It's a kind of quick review of the main points of his speech. Um, if we look closely at it, though, we see those two key principles, right? That only special warrants and not general warrants are constitutional. And secondly, that the courts should be the ones to determine whether an act of parliamentary legislation is constitutional or not. These are the two great principles that come from the 1761 Otis speech. Now, there's in some interesting things about the text of the speech. I mentioned that it was published in the Massachusetts Spy in 1773, and that was the uh, first appearance of the speech in public. But we know that the speech was five hours long, and if you read out loud the text that I gave you, it would take you only about 18 minutes to read the whole thing. So what happened to the rest of the speech? Well, the transcript that we have of the speech comes from the notes that John Adams took when he was in the courtroom listening to Otis's argument. Adams didn't write a verbatim transcript. He wasn't a court stenographer. He was just making notes for himself. And then after the trial ended, uh, Adams drafted what he called his abstract of the speech. And that's the only text of the speech um, that exists. It's the one that went into the Massachusetts Spy. It was published there by one of Adams's law clerks. And then it was republished in a number of early American histories uh, after that. But since we don't have the full text, we don't know the entirety of James Otis's argument. Many years later, John Adams gave some further recollections about things he remembered Otis arguing in some letters that he wrote to some fellow American revolutionaries. But in those later recollections, Adams doesn't give us any sort of word-for-word -word transcript of the Otis speech. So the best we have is this text of the speech as it was originally published in the Massachusetts Spy. But is that enough? And I guess we could ask, is that enough with this abbreviated text to include Otis's address in a, the canon of great speeches in American history? And I think if we think about that, those two legal principles, especially that uh, advocacy of the right of protection against illegal search, right of protection against general warrants, 
and the question of judicial supremacy in the courts deciding the unconstitutionality of acts of legislation. The, the, the long-term influence of those two arguments is what justifies inclusion of this speech in a canon of great American speeches. So I asked you also to take a look at an article on the Otis speech. This was an article that I published in the New England Quarterly. And this particular article focuses on John Adams's effort to try to get people to remember the James Otis speech, right? So uh, the question asks here, what's the thesis or key point of the article? And how does it help us understand why the speaker and speech is worthy of inclusion in great speakers and speeches? And I think if we look at the article itself, those questions are answered. It was John Adams, awed by the implications of the forensic drama he witnessed in the Superior Court that day, who from a few notes he took during the hearing crafted an abstract of Otis's address. But it was not till after the American Revolution, amidst the earliest efforts to chronicle and document the great struggle for independence, did Adams take up the cause of James Otis in earnest and launch his campaign to transform an impassioned forensic argument of local interest into a revered oration of national and historical significance. Indeed, because Adams thought that Otis wasn't getting his due. He wasn't being properly remembered. Remember, Otis died in 1783, which was the year that the treaty was signed between Great Britain and America. And so it's not until uh, many years later that the first histories of the American Revolution uh, begin to be written. Some of the founding fathers begin to die. Uh, Adams himself is one of the last founding fathers to die. He dies with Thomas Jefferson on uh, July the 4th, 1826. But as the founders are passing away, more and more people are interested in making sure their story is preserved. And John Adams tries to help that public memory by telling the story of the Otis speech against writs of assistance. We note in the article, as far back as 1761, Adams had recognized the political and legal significance of Otis's oration, and through his later correspondence, he had sought to revive interest in and to disseminate the writs of assistance speech. Indeed, Adams copied out the speech and sent it to correspondents and even to other newspapers um, so that it could be republished and preserved. In one version or another, Adams's original report of Otis's speech entered into the stream of public memory and has remained there ever since, revered as an oration representative of early opposition to British violations of American rights. Were it not for the patient historical labors of John Adams, that valuable piece of our patrimony might have been forever lost. So there is a look at the famous speech by James Otis against writs of assistance in Boston in 1761. And uh, if you have some questions or comments about the speech or about the article on the speech, um, please feel free to post those to the discussion board.